Hi there, and welcome to our fourth episode of Meet the Author, sponsored by the Association for Canadian Jewish Studies. My name is Richard Mankus, and I'm excited to have a chance to talk to our guest, Pierre Anctil, about his new book, A Reluctant Welcome for Jewish People, Voices in Le Devoir's Editorials, 1919 to 1947. It's an important work that analyzes editorials about Jews in the influential Le Devoir and provides translations for many of them and is thus an important mirror of aspects of the relationship between Jewish and non-Jewish Quebecers. The book previously appeared in French and has been translated now into English by Tunu Onu. Before I introduce Pierre and our special guest interviewer, Ms. Janice Rosen, a few words about the organization. The Association for Canadian Jewish Studies is the only organization dedicated solely to the interdisciplinary study of the Canadian Jewish experience. We publish the annual Jewish journal, Canadian Jewish Studies, a two brief Canadian, a newsletter twice a year, and hold an annual conference. Because of COVID, we canceled our last conference and decided to inaugurate this series of online events. In addition to Meet the Author episodes, we have hosted a session on Hate Online, and we'll be soon launching our series of field trips to archives holding materials on the Canadian Jewish experience. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out what we've done and to find out about upcoming events. After the interview, you'll find a link to the association's webpage, and we strongly encourage you to join and help fulfill our mandate of deepening our understanding of the Canadian Jewish experience. Our guest today is Pierre Anctil. Pierre is a full professor of history at the University of Ottawa, where he teaches contemporary Canadian history and Canadian Jewish history. He has written at length on the history of the Jewish community of Canada and on the current debates on cultural pluralism in Montreal. We will be discussing his most recent book, which has been published by the University of Ottawa Press. And after the interview, you'll find, an inform you'll find information on ordering the book and a discount code. Pierre, welcome to the show. Thank you. Merci. Joining us as guest interviewer is Ms. Janice Rosen. Janice has been an uh, archives director since 1989 of the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives, formerly known as the Canadian Jewish Congress National Archives. She has published widely on Canadian Jewish archival resources and is the editor of a regular section called The Archives Matter in our journal, Canadian Jewish Studies. Janice, welcome to the show. I will be the other interviewer. In addition to serving as the co-organizer of this series of online events with Jesse Tufexis of the University of Ottawa, I'm a historian at the University of British Columbia specializing in the history of Canadian Jewry. Okay, Pierre, we've done the introductory spiel, the preliminaries, and we can turn to the questions. Let me start with the observation that this has not been the first time that you've published about Le Devoir and the Jews, and that you, um, and you came up with a short monograph about the subject in French on the subject in 1988. Now, I know a lot's changed since then, not least when I look at the back cover, I see a person who, like me, has had some changes in terms of, uh, in terms of what his follicles have been doing. Um, beyond that, um, can you tell me what it is that's brought you back to this subject after so many years? Well, first of all, Le Devoir celebrated its 100 years. So it's 1910, 2010. And that was an occasion to launch new studies on Le Devoir that had nothing to do specifically with Jewish Canadian history, but uh, was a study about the editorial stance of Le Devoir in the first 50 years. So three volumes were published, one under the directorship of Henri Bourassa, the founder, up to 1932, another one about Georges Pelletier, up to 1947, and a third one about Gérard Fillion, up to 1963. So what we did is we um, prepared uh, anthologies of the best editorials over this 53-year period, covering all aspects of life, both national and Quebecois, Montreal, and international. While we were doing this, I, I did the first two volumes. I was 
putting aside each time I saw one, all the editorials that had to do with Jewish issues, whether Palestine, whether Montreal, whether elections, anti-Semitism, refusal to accept Jewish immigrants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I feel this way, I had a much better grasp of what existed in Le Devoir than uh, I had previously obtained in 1988. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Janice. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, please fire away. Look forward to your questions. Well, there, there is really so much to absorb in this book. Um, but I'd like to direct most of my questions to points which you raise in your very comprehensive and analytical introduction. Uh, firstly, regarding the title, you write, just as with the three preceding volumes of the original series published in French, the one you just mentioned, the present book, A Reluctant Welcome for Jewish People, bears a title that reflects the thinking of Le Devoir respecting the Jewish presence in Canada and elsewhere in the world. But unlike the title of the French edition, A Chacun ses Juifs, the reluctant welcome phrase is at most a summary of the particular editorial that it references. And that stands out to me, given how meticulously close the translation is throughout the book. Um, what was the reason for this choice? Well, the, the English translation to A Chacun ses Juifs would have been to everyone their own Jews. Now, in English, that doesn't resonate very much since the English language readership is not well acquainted with Le Devoir in general. In some publications have dealt with Le Devoir seriously, um, but that has not been the case for the most part. Um, so um, the press has felt that since the key issue in those 50 years, the first 50 years of Le Devoir relating to Jews, was the issue of the immigration of German Jews in the early 30s, uh, sorry, in the late 30s, uh, that this is probably, and I agreed with their analysis, this was probably the issue which, which was most prominent in Le Devoir around the time of Kristallnacht. And it brought out a number of less visible issues earlier in Le Devoir's history that became with Kristallnacht and beginnings of World War II a much more central issue because the desire for German Jews to leave Germany increased and uh, many came, as we know, knocking on Canada's doors. So this is uh, probably the central issue. Why Le Devoir uh, reacted this way has to do uh, with uh, a number of factors that we, we can discuss later in the interview. But uh, basically, uh, the sense was that Jews could not assimilate into French Canadian society. Basically, because they were not Christians, because they were urban people, most of them in Germany, and, and French Canada still had this notion of itself, that it was a rural people, and basically uh, because Jews were felt as not able to assimilate into French Canadian society, given the criterion of the time. Um, that, of course, was quite different from the position of English Canada, who did not necessarily welcome the Jewish German, Jewish German immigrants with greater warmth, but didn't have these arguments to present. My next question may elaborate a little further on that theme um, because you raised the possibility in your introduction as to whether there is, and I'm quoting, a way of judging the position of Le Devoir that takes into account Jewish community sensitivity, which was greatly exacerbated during this period, and at the same time provides an objective analysis of the text published in the newspaper from 1910 to 1947. So I'm asking in brief, how would you answer this question? Do you think the Canadian Jewish Congress officials were mistaken in their perception of Le Devoir at the time? And should they have been less upset about the anti-Semitic articles or remarks published there than they were about seeing anti-Semitism elsewhere in the 30s? 
Well, that's, that's a very interesting statement. And that's probably why the book was produced, is to try to see through this complex issue. Um, if, we, if we take the Congress officials, except H.M. Kaiserman, who was Romanian, and arrived in Montreal in 1910, and could read French to a certain degree and speak it, most Congress officials at the time were incapable of reading French. And so they developed a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, one of them was that Le Devoir was like Arcan's newspapers. As you know, Arcan had a number of newspapers, uh, Le Goglu, Le Chameau, Le Miroir, Le Patriot. And the confusion between Le Devoir and Arcan is one of the problems that uh, emerges in the period. The Jewish leadership cannot see through the difference between the two. Uh, another problem that emerges is, uh, is that actually Le Devoir, uh, the perspective that it presents is, is a very highly intellectual, very high level of French. And I think that was beyond the command, not because they were ignorant, but because they didn't have those skills necessarily as recently immigrated Jews from Eastern Europe. It was much easier to deal with the Anglo-British press, which was the dominant press of Canada. That you had to relate to. But French Canada was sorted in the shadow. And it, was, it wasn't until after the Second World War that Congress moved forward to better understand French Canada. This, this period of the 30s was a complex period. Um, much of the um, judgment that Le Devoir uh, came under had to do with an event which took place much earlier, uh, even before the founding of Le Devoir, when uh, Henri Bourassa was a member of parliament in Ottawa. In 1906, he publicly condemned in parliament the Russian Jews and the immigration of Russian Jews following the pogroms of Kishinev, for instance, to Canada. And he changed in the course of his career and did not use the same language in Le Devoir itself after. But those remarks of 1906 left a very deep and I would say a scar, a deep impression, negative impression about Le Devoir which Congress, when founded in 1919 and then reactivated in 34, kept in the back of its mind. People remembered those words and felt that the Le Devoir was globally and entirely anti-Semitic, much like uh, Arcan's papers. And, and by the way, uh, this is a judgment that we see uh, almost to the present day in the historiography, when books and articles and notions about Le Devoir published in English seem to dwell on this very negative perspective, not taking into consideration always the more fine points. Um. So you, you write that the task of academic research is not to right wrongs committed many decades ago, nor to condemn past attitudes deemed unacceptable today, but that you simply hope to have been able to contribute to a better knowledge of situations clearly belonging to the past, but to which we are heirs. By saying that, do you, do you hope that this publication will in some may, way redeem the stature of Le Devoir in the eyes of Canada's Anglophone Jews and other English readers? Well. I think that was irrelevant in my perspective. Um, today, Le Devoir is still published, and it, it may or may not be read by people of, of Jewish origins in Canada. Um, the um, debates have changed completely. We're no longer uh, in the pre-war or interwar period. And um, quite frankly, um, when I read Le Devoir today, I, I see uh, nothing uh, really uh, affecting uh, Canadian Jews or negative perceptions. Very rare that you'll get a negative perception. Um, what I wanted to, to do is um, 
to bring forward historiographically a change in the perception that historians have of Le Devoir. Uh, especially uh, given that a number of historians who write in English have uh, made statements about Le Devoir, which uh, basically turn out to be um, incorrect. When I did my study of Le Devoir, the, on a period of 37 years, from the founding to the death of uh, Georges Pelletier, I found roughly 200 editorials on Le Devoir about Jews. That's 200 on 11,000. So that's 2%. It's very difficult to believe, uh, given the data that was collected, that the Devoir was a significantly anti-Semitic paper. It had at times, especially in the period of the uh, German Jewish refugee movement, it had anti-Semitic overtones, but basically, it, it did not pay attention very much. It was not interested. It had other fish to fry. Uh, of these 200 uh, editorials, 50% carry no negative charge. So we're down to 100. Of these, about 40 are clearly editorials rejecting Jewish immigration to Canada, and they're bunched basically at the end of the 30s. So this is what I found. Uh, and not like the Arcan editorials and Arcan publications, newspapers that constantly, day in and day out, inundated uh, the public with hostile perceptions of Jews. Most of the time, in normal years, uh, Le Devoir had a couple of editorials on Jews. And often, uh, containing only partial information, maybe a sentence or a paragraph. It's only when uh, Hitler came to power and the situation in Germany greatly worsened uh, that, like all Canadian newspapers, Le Devoir had to pay attention to what was going on in Europe and pay attention to the uh, plight of uh, German Jews. Before, it was a marginal subject. I'm glad that you mentioned the corpus of 209 editorials because I was very taken by the appendix at the end of your book where you list all of them, even the ones you didn't mention in the book itself and, and you actually rate them by their, whether they were negative or neutral. Um, so for my last question, I'd like to turn to the editorials themselves. If you were to choose one that stands out for you that has a negative depiction of the Jewish community and another that has a neutral or positive depiction, which ones would they be? And perhaps at the same time, you might want to comment on the ideologies or social realities that shape those different sets of attitudes. Well, yes, it's very interesting. There's a lot of ambiguity in the devoir. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, uncertainty as to how to position the newspaper. Uh, Henri Bourassa himself never wrote about the Jews in Le Devoir, there are very few instances, and they're generally neutral. But Omer Rirou, who was the most prolific of Le Devoir's editorials, he wrote about 5,000 in his career. Um, about Jews, he must have written about maybe 80. And he constantly moves back and forth. Um, Jews are not part of our society. They should be left outside. We have to be cautious. We have to examine the issue with care and caution. On the other hand, he says, they're like us. Because French Canadians are a minority and they're vulnerable in Canada to the Anglophone majority, like us, Jews, have found ways to resist and to reaffirm their presence and resist discrimination. So perhaps we should imitate them. Perhaps we should 
see that their solution is interesting, and that solution is ethnic solidarity and community cohesiveness. So Le Devoir both feared and admired, and this is constant, it fluctuates. It's never a downright condemnation. It's a position of discomfort or of uncertainty. So I've chosen two editorials, one by Pelletier, which is a condemnation of the plans to bring German Jews to Canada in 1938, late 38, beginning 39, just before the war. And the other one is, is an editorial by Omer Heroux, which presents this complex relationship between two minorities. Now, much has been written sometimes presenting French Canada as a group in Canada, which is entirely false. It's very difficult to see French Canadian politicians or French Canadians as an influence in Canada, swaying the entire country away from its track. So there, when you look at Le Devoir, you can see the sense of minorization and vulnerability. Uh, these editorial, of course, were done in, written in French. And the translation brings out some of the elements. But of course, uh, Tonu did a great job. Tonu Onu, he did as much as he could. But of course, I recommend reading them in French. But since um, we have to contend with reality, and, and French is, is not necessarily a language that everyone possesses, uh, we can certainly look at, uh, at those texts in translation. But the study was done in French and the term, all the, of course, the editorials were, were examined in the original language. And the book appeared in 2014. So this is an editorial. This is a famous editorial, La Chacun ses Juif, translated as to everyone their own Jews. Uh, December 3, 1938, basically a month after Kristallnacht, and, and Georges Pelletier muses about what will happen. And he says, because some of the French press felt that one solution to the uh, Jewish refugee problem, which was emerging with the Evian conference and all this, was to send Jews to the colonies to places where uh, there was room and there was little objection and uh, areas that were sparsely populated like Canada. So here's his answer to sending Jews to Canada. We have our own Jews and we do not persecute them. They live happily and in wealth without being repressed. Their presence constitutes one of the multitude of major problems that Canada needs to resolve quietly and without injustice, first and foremost to itself. We have enough of our own problems, starting with, Jew with our Jewish problem. This is not the time to make any of the problems worse. The propositions such as those from the star, the Montreal star, and still less that of Mr. Mr. de Kirillis, who was French, who has no business in Canada's affairs, solved nothing. To listen and want to follow up on these propositions, bringing Jews in, uh, would lead to a dead end. The solution to the issue lies elsewhere than in the, the mass migration of German Jews to Canada. The issue is really a European one, and we old stock Canadians refuse to suffer its consequences. Not long after, actually almost a year after, Omer Hiroux has uh, a different set of values to present. He's not against uh, first uh, observations by uh, Pelletier, but he has um, doubts. And he writes, um, in French, um, et, et, um, uh, imitant uh, les Juifs. In, in English, the Jews as a model. So he writes, we would 
be making a mistake if we did not learn from the action just taken by the Jews of Canada. They were protesting about something. One of the commentators on Seka Asi, that's a radio station, spoke about the Jews in Russia and their role in the revolution. In other words, Jews were responsible for the Bolshevik revolution. The Jews of Canada determined that the comment was unjust regarding their fellow Jews over there. There were immediate protests. The Canadian Jewish Congress intervened. Mr. Berkovich entered the fray. The Jews won on all points. Is there any French Canadian the least bit concerned with our collective interests who would not have said on the issue, when will we show a similar esprit de corps and energy? When will we, not regarding the French of Europe, but regarding the French here, the oldest Canadians, know how to assert ourselves? He concludes, if we simply only knew how to act, like the Jews. But you see the two very different approaches, almost on the same page of Le Devoir, by two individuals who um, shared much and had similar notions on almost all subjects. So it goes that way constantly, it wavers. Good choices. I, I, I would have chosen those two. <laughs> so, so there's 60 editorials in, in Le Devoir, out of 200, we reproduce 60, having to do with 13 themes, some having Canadian uh, overtones, others having European, and others having Palestinian, uh, under the British mandate. And, um, and Overall, uh, it presents a much richer and much contrasted picture than uh, what was presented in the uh, historiography up to the present time. And hopefully, uh, this will uh, bring people to reflect more seriously on doing research in French and, and not rely on, relying on secondary sources. Uh, and often, what uh, is the result of this is, is the blind lead the blind. The secondary sources are themselves from secondary sources and, and eventually you get nowhere. You get in a, in a dead end because nobody has really, really seriously read the uh, French language documentation. Thank you, Janice. Those are great questions. Um, so Pierre, uh, just to ask a final question, um, we, uh, we usually ask the authors uh, what they're working on now. Well, I happen to know one of the projects you're working on now, um, but I also know that um, you're working on a study of the uh, newspaper L'Action Catholique. Um, now, does your research in that newspaper cast some sort of new light on your work on Le Devoir? It's often said that French Canadian nationalism like the nationalists of Le Devoir drew deeply from French Canada's nation, from French Canada's Catholicism. Does your new research clarify or reinforce your understanding of how Catholic teachings shaped nationalist thinking on Judaism and Quebec's Jewish community? You're absolutely right. Uh, Le Devoir was not a religious paper. Its, its main editorials were deeply Catholic individuals, but they never stressed the religious aspect. Uh, they were secular nationalists. L'Action Catholique, which appeared in Quebec City, was the largest paper in the 30s when I did the study uh, in Quebec City, was clearly a church-oriented paper. And I feel, I always felt, that the origins of, of Quebec anti-Semitism was in the teachings of the Catholic Church. And it's amply proved by my study of L'Action Catholique, uh, which went to, um, I, I, th I would say, um, obtained from the doctrinal and theological statements made by the Church about Jews 
took from there the substance of its anti-Semitism. Now, we're not speaking of something which took place in the 20th century. We're speaking of statements made by the uh, first major writers and commentators of the Catholic Church at the beginning of the Middle Ages. So it's a very long tradition of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Jews, based essentially on religious reasons, that Jews did not convert and remained for this reason in a state of, I would say, impurity or uh, inappropriate uh, existence the, to resist the teachings of Christ was a sin. And they, um, this is very much reproduced in Action Catholique. It's present in Le Devoir, but it's never stated so clearly. Um, this is very different from the type of anti Semitism which emerged in English Canada, which is more motivated by racial notions. The French Canadians felt that Jews had wrong religious beliefs, immoral, unacceptable, uh, that they uh, were uh, in a situation of, of having missed the key moment in history, the coming of Christ. Um, and so it was strictly tied to Catholic morality. And that type of anti-Semitism generally resisted violence or forced conversions or assault against the Talmud or open insults, public insults. Of course, we know in history this was not always the case, but in, in the situation in Montreal in the 20th century, uh, it's quite different. The way out of this was conversion. If, if, and we know what that means today, and we, we know, of course, that Jews could not accept this. But the paper says, if conversion takes place, then all is forgotten. And Jews can enter into the Catholic Church overnight and become Christians with no stigma attached. Because what matters is what they believe. It's not their racial origins. The church felt that it was Catholic, that it was open to all races and all peoples. So it's, it, it's I'm describing it from an ideal position, of course. It's not so simple in historical terms, but French and English Canada produced forms of anti-Semitism that did not relate to the same notions, to the same origins, and did not produce the same discourse. The anti-Semites that were read in English Canada were not read in French Canada, and the opposite is also true. Few people would have read in English Canada, Edouard Drummond or Alphonse Daudet or uh, um, uh, Maurras or Abbé Maximilien Lamarck that were dominant figures of Francophone anti-Semitism, unless in translation. And their sources and interpretation was, were quite different also. So we have to keep in mind, we're not dealing with one kind of anti-Semitism in Canada. We're dealing with two from the majority communities with different results and different ways of thinking. Okay. Um, I know that we're going to have a lot to talk about in the future because we have different views about, uh, about how to understand the history of Catholic teachings about Jews and, um, and that those change over time too, especially in the late 19th century. So we're going to have what to talk about when a new book comes out, but I'm not going to go there just now. I'm okay, going to, I'm going to start, I'm going to finish now by, by thanking, first of all, uh, Janice, thank you very much for being a, a guest interviewer. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you, Janice. And Pierre, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to answer these questions. And, um, and yeah, like I said, we look forward to your future work. Um, my name is Richard Mankus. Uh, please keep watching so that you can find out information about joining the Association for Canadian Jewish Studies and for ordering information um, from the University of Ottawa and a discount code for Pierre's book.
again, thank you for watching. Stay healthy. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.